I think we've all heard of the word bacteria. Let me make sure. Bacteria. And we normally associate it with kind of negative things. That you say, bacteria, those are germs. So we normally associate those with germs. And they indeed are germs. And they cause a whole set of negative things. Or at least from our, you know, kind of the, the standard point of view, people believe that they cause a whole bunch of negative things. So just let's just list them all just to make sure we, we, know, we know about them. We're all on the same page. So the, the bad things they do, they cause a lot of diseases. Tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Lyme disease, Lyme disease. I mean, I could go on and on. They, you know, pretty much any time, well, I'll be careful here. Whenever people talk about an infection, it's often caused by a bacteria. It could also be caused by a virus. An infection is, gen in general, anything entering you and taking advantage of your body to kind of replicate itself and in the process making you sick. But bacterial infections, let me write that down. Bacterial infections. And this whole perception of bacteria being a bad thing is probably a good reason why almost any soap you see now says antibacterial on it. Antibacterial. Because the, the makers of the soap know that in just um, in conventional thinking, bacteria is viewed as a negative thing. And you're like, OK, Sal, I know where you're going with this. You know, Bacteria isn't all bad. There are some good traits of bacteria. Good. For example, I can make, I could stick some yogurt in some, or I could stick some bacteria in some milk, and it'll help produce some yogurt. Yogurt, sometimes spelled yogurt. Yogurt, you know, and that's that's obviously a good thing. It's a it's a it's a delicious thing to eat. Uh, you say, well, I know I have bacteria in my gut, and my gut helps me digest food. And these are all true, but you're like, look, you know what? On balance, I still think bacteria is a bad thing. And just to, you know, I'm not going to take sides on that debate, as I tend to avoid taking sides on debates in these science videos. Maybe I'll do a whole playlist where, I'll, where I do nothing but take sides on debates. But here, I won't take any sides on that. But I'll just point out that you are, to a large degree, made up of bacteria. It's not just your gut. It's not just the gut or the yogurt you might eat or the plaque on your teeth, which is caused by ba bacteria. It's this kind of uh, film that's created by bacteria that eventually causes cavities and whatever else. And it's not just the pimples on your face. The pimples on your face. Bacteria actually represents a majority of the, uh, I guess we call it, of the cells on your body. So for every. Forever, and this is a kind of an astounding fact. For every one cell on the human body, every one human cell, one human cell. So these are all cells that you know all have your DNA in them, and they all have nucleuses. And I'll talk about that in a second. You have 20 bacteria. 20 bacteria. Now your response there says, okay, I, that's fair enough. But these bacteria must be much smaller than the human cells. So it must be a very small fraction of my mass. And you're right. It's not like we're mostly bacteria by mass, although we are mostly bacteria by actual cells. But even if you were to take out all of the water in your body, then by mass, bacteria is going to be roughly 10% of your mass of your mass. So I weigh about 150 pounds. I've got 15 pounds of bacteria walking around with me. So you know, one we always kind of think ourselves as like, you know, the bacteria is riding on us, but to a large degree, we're kind of in symbiosis. We're kind of two creatures, or not just two creatures, two types of creatures living together because I don't have just one type of bacteria on me. I have thousands of types of bacteria on me. And there's a huge amount of diversity. And we're just scratching the surface in terms of the, the number and types and diversity of bacteria that exist. So I've talked a lot about bacteria. And hopefully, this fact right here will make you realize that they're super important to just our everyday existence. And just to make, you know, make sure we understand the magnitude of this, in a previous video, and I, and I looked this up again, we have on the order of, we have on the order of 10 to 100 trillion cells, human cells trillion cells. So for every one of these we have 20 bacteria. We're talking we're talking about having on the order of 200 to 2000 
trillion bacteria on us at any time. Trillion bacteria. And I'm a hygienic person. I'm no, you know, I, I take showers daily, and that's even me. It's not like you can somehow eliminate them. And even more, it's not like you even want to eliminate them. But that's fair enough. You're probably asking, okay, Sal, I'm I'm convinced that bacteria are important. What what do they actually look like? And they're these small unicellular organisms. I mean, that's my bacteria right there. And they're different from the cells that make up us. And when I say us, I'll throw in all plants, animals, and funguses, fungi. And the big difference, or the one that people noticed first, is that all of the eukarya, eukarya, which includes plants, animals, and fungi, all of their DNA is, in con is inside of a nucleus, a cellular nucleus. So that's the nucleus right there, nucleus. And all of our DNA, it's normally in its chromatin form. It's all just you know, spread around something like that on in bacteria which are you know what people originally just classified on whether or not you have a nucleus in bacteria there is no membrane surrounding the dna so what they have is just a big a big bundle of dna so they just have this big bundle of dna it's sometimes in a in a loop all in one circle called a nucleoid Nucleoid. Nucleoid. Now, whenever we, you know, we look at something, we say, "Oh, we have this thing; it doesn't." There's this assumption that somehow we're superior or we're uh, more advanced, advanced beings. But the reality is, is that bacteria have infiltrated far more ecosystems in every part of the planet than eukarya have, and there's far more diversity in bacteria in bacteria than there is in eukarya. So uh, w when you really think about it, these are the more successful successful organisms. If we were to have, you know, if a, if a, if a, if a comet were to hit the Earth, God forbid, the, the, the organisms more likely to survive are going to be the bacteria than the eukarya, than the ones with, with the, 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 you know, the lar not always larger, but the organisms that do have this uh, nucleus and have membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and all of that. And we'll talk more about it in the future. Bacteria, for the most part, are just big bags of cytoplasm. They have their DNA there. They do have ribosomes because they need to have to, they have to code for proteins just like the rest of us do. And some of those proteins, they'll make some for from bacteria. They'll make these flagella, which are tails that allow them to move around that allow them to move around. And they also have these things called pili. Pili is plural for pilus or pilus. So these pili. And we'll see in a second that the pili are kind of the how the bacteria are able to do one form of introducing genetic variation into their into their into their populations. But a big and actually, I'll take a little side note here. I've, I'm pointing out bacteria as not having a cell wall. There's actually another class that used to be categorized as type of a bacteria, and they're called archaea. And I should give them a little bit of justice. They're always kind of the stepchild. Archae, archaea. They used to be called archaea bacteria, but now people realize they've actually looked at the DNA. Because when they originally looked at these, they said, OK, these guys also have no nucleus and a bunch of DNA running around. These must be a form of bacteria. But now that we've actually been able to look into the DNA of the things, we've seen that they're actually quite different. But all of these, both of these, both bacteria and archaea, are considered prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. And this just means that no, no nucleus. No nucleus, and more generally, I mean, this is what most people refer to. But more generally, they don't have these membrane-bound organelles that our cells have. Now, the next question you might say is, well, how do these bacteria reproduce? And for the most part, they do something not, not completely different from mitosis, although I don't want to call it mitosis. We call it binary fission. Binary fission. Binary fission. I'm not going to go into the deep mechanism here, but the idea is fairly simple. I have a bacteria right here. It replicates its DNA, so it starts, you know, it'll have two these nucleodes here, and then the cytoplasm essentially splits. Or, you know, you can it's kind of a form of cleavage right there. It splits, and then you have two of them. You have two of them then. And then each of them 
They can code for the proteins necessary to produce all of their extra appendages, the flagellum, which is this long tail-like thing that can help it move. And it's actually fascinating, because it's operating at such a small scale, but you can still kind of get these this motor movement going on, even at this very, very small scale, using very primitive, I don't want to say primitive, because that's making a value judgment on these things, but using you know the, these flagellum on the order of several nanometers uh, on the order of tens of nanometers wide. So I mean, it's not this, you know, you don't have a lot of atoms to deal with, but you're still able to get this kind of um, wave-like motion that can move the bacteria around. Now you're saying, hey, Sal, in that first video on on evolution, you told me that you know bacteria. We see evolution every day, and bacteria is one example. You know, when we use antibiotics, they we think it'll help eliminate bacteria, but that one bacteria that has some type of resistance, it'll survive, and so it is more fit. How do these guys get variation? Well, the one way, and this is a way everything can get variation, is they can get mutations. Mutations and bacteria uh, replicate so quickly; they reproduce so quickly that even if, even if you know you have a mutation is one in every thousand times, by the time you have a million bacteria, you'll have a thousand mutations. So you have mutations, but they also have this form. I don't want to call it sexual reproduction because it's not sexual reproduction. They don't form gametes, and the gametes don't fertilize each other and then produce a zygote. But two bacteria, two bacteria, can get near each other near each other and then one of their peluses peluses I'll do that right here so the peluses are these little structures on the side of the bacteria they're these little tubes really one of the peluses can connect from one bacteria to another and then essentially you have a mixing of what's what's inside one bacteria with another so let me draw their nucleoids their nucleoids and then they have these other pieces of just DNA that hangs out called plasmids. These are just circular pieces of DNA. Plasmids. Maybe this guy's got this extra neat plasmid. He got it from someplace. And it's making him able to do things that this guy couldn't do. Maybe, maybe this is the R plasmid, which is known for making a bacteria resistant to a lot of antibiotics. And what happens is is that bacteria, and actually there's mechanisms where the bacteria know that, hey, this guy doesn't have the R plasmid. And we're just beginning to understand how it actually works. But this will actually replicate itself and give this guy a version of the R plasmid. You could also have these things transposons. And I should make a whole video on this, because we have transposons too. But there's parts of DNA that can jump from one part of a fragment of DNA to another. And these can also end up in the other one. So what you have is kind of, it's not formal sexual reproduction, but what you just essentially have is a connection. And these bacteria are just constantly swapping DNA with each other. And DNA is jumping back and forth. So you can imagine that all sorts of combinations of DNA happen even within a, a, a what, what you used to call one bacterial species. And very quickly, it can turn to multiple species and become resistant to different things. If, if this makes it resistant to an antibiotic, then it can kind of spread the information to produce those resistant proteins or whatever to the other bacteria. So this is kind of a form of introducing variation. And so when you when you transfer stuff via this pilus, or the, the plural is pili, this is called conjugation, bacterial conjugation. Conjugation. Now the last thing I want to talk about, because this is something that you've heard a lot about, are antibiotics. Antibiotics. A lot of people, they get sick. The first thing they want to get is an antibiotic. Antibiotic. And an antibiotic is just a whole class of chemicals and compounds, some of them naturally derived, some of them not, that kill back kill kill bacteria. So now if someone has is undergoing a surgery and there's you know, they get a cut, um, instead of them having to worry about getting the infection, they'll take some antibiotics to prevent the the bacteria from growing on them. But the question is where does this you know, how is this how is this discovered or where does it come from? It actually came from it came from Alexander Fleming. Let me write him down. Very important because the discovery of antibiotics is, in my opinion, the most important discovery in medicine so far. So Alexander, Alexander Fleming. He was studying, I think it was Staphylococcus. I forget which bacteria it was, but it was in a petri dish. He was in a petri dish. Let me draw a petri dish. It's a little circle. There's some nutrients that the bacteria can grow on. So let's say the bacteria, you know, it's it's growing on this petri dish. And he went out and he came back into the room and he saw that some mold, some some fungus, 
had had grown on this kind of bluish greenish fungus had grown on the center of his petri dish on the center of his petri dish and the bacteria there was kind of this space around it, and the bacteria couldn't get close to it and this mold this this fungus was called this penicillium the penicillium fungus he was able to figure that out he took a sample of this and then he cultured it which means letting it grow and then seeing what it is this was penicillium and he figured out that, gee, this, this fungus must have something, some chemical that it's emitting, that's essentially killing the bacteria around it, that's not allowing the bacteria to get near it. And so that led to the discovery of penicillin. Penicillin. I see. A pena, penicillin. And now that you discuss this was in the late 20s, so 1920s. Now, once you know, by the time World War II came around, now people had gunshot wounds and they had to get things amputated, whatnot. But for the first time, they could actually give people antibiotics and not worry about, or they probably still worried about it, but didn't have to worry about this thing as much as they did before. And now, you know, if you have a bacteria, if you have tuberculosis or Lyme disease or anything, the 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 the, the treatment all involves taking antibiotics and there are many many more types of antibiotics now coming from many many more different sources but the general idea is the same you want to kill bacteria although you don't want to kill all bacteria because some of it's good in fact we are made up of a lot of bacteria there's even there's even uh, I don't know if I even mentioned this earlier in the video there's bacteria in our skin that helps take up oil and moisturize us and make our our skin nice and supple so you know the way you think about it, you could view them as negative or you could view them as positive or you could view them as something in between but the really amazing thing at least in my mind is that we're living in symbiosis with them. I remember I saw a Star Trek episode once where you had these you had these people you had these people and you know there was some alien race Jean Jean Luc Picard had had you know they ran into them they looked very humanoid like that. But it turns out, let me draw this human that they had these little bugs in their brain stem. So they had these big insects in their brain stem, and these insects started infecting the crew of the Enterprise and making people, and they were controlling their brains and making them act weird and whatever not. And this seemed like a very bizarre alien concept, right? Of some creepy crawly living in us and affecting our brains and affecting us in some ways. But if you really think about it, we are doing this, and it's not just with one little bug. It's with, it's with on the order of trillions, hundreds of trillions of bugs are with us every day, and they make us us. I mean, I'm here recording videos with, uh, along with, or maybe I should even say the bacteria is recording videos, or it's maybe partially responsible for controlling bacteria. And it's, even, it's known that the bacteria can even affect our mental state. There's a bun whole bunch of research now that certain types of bacteria can uh, can cause schizophrenia. Actually, syphilis does. Uh, bacteria can cause depression, a uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. It's known that when it, you go into later phases of Lyme disease, it can cause uh, it can affect the the mental condition of the person who's who who has the infection. So it affects every part of who we are. I mean, it would it would be hard to even talk of being a human being without the the ten percent of our mass or the you know two thousand trillion cells of or two thousand trillion bacteria that really make us us.